Our next speaker is Joanna Phillips. Joanna is the Associate Conservator of Contemporary Art at the Guggenheim Museum and focuses on the conservation of time-based media artworks. At the Guggenheim, Phillips has launched the first media art conservation lab in a U.S. museum and is developing and implementing new strategies for the preservation, reinstallation, and documentation of media artworks. One of her latest publications is the Compendium of Image Errors in Analog Video, a first-of-its-kind reference work for conservators and curators who are in charge of video art collections. As a committee member of the Electronic Media Group of the American Institute for Conservation, Phillips is a founding co-organizer and co-programmer of EMG's educational workshop series, Tech Focus. Prior to her Guggenheim appointment, Phillips specialized in the conservation of contemporary art at the Swiss Institute for Art Research in Zurich and explored the challenges of media art conservation as a conservation researcher in the Swiss project Active Archive. Phillips holds an MA in paintings conservation from the Hochschule for Bildenden Künste Dresden, Germany. Joanna. I'm actually maybe going to work off the script anyways. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, thank you very much um, to the organizers, um, namely to Tiana Doherty and the Smithsonian American Art Museum, for putting this wonderful event together and for providing a platform um, for all of us to discuss our experiences in conserving and exhibiting um, the works of Namjoon Pike. I think it's safe to say that there's probably no other media artist that has triggered as much discussion about the conservation of media art as Namjoon Pike. This is the second Pike Symposium that I'm attending in the last couple of years. International research collaborations have published substantial case studies on preserving his art. Conservators' master and PhD theses revolve around Pike's works. And museum conservators like myself are enthusiastic about treating and reinstalling Pike's works and publishing about the challenges and strategies. So why does art conservation engage in such an ongoing love relationship with Namjoon's work? I think what really captures conservators' attention is the intriguing contrast between Pike's own very flexible approach towards the notions of original and authorship and I'm not only talking about his artistic practice, but also um, him as an advisor to the maintenance and um, conservation of his work. And the fact that the majority of his works are not very flexible at all when it comes to migration because they are so inherently and conceptually analog. And I'm talking about the installed works, lesser about the single channel works that um, um, Laurie talked about today. Uh, let's see if this works. Yes, it does. To illustrate the dependency of the majority of Pike's artworks on analog technologies, I would like to take a, close, a closer look at the three works from the Guggenheim collection, Random Access, TV Crown, and TV Garden, which are all currently on view here at the Smithsonian, and I hope you get the chance to look at them in real life later today. Random Access is an interactive audio installation and its main component is an open reel audio deck that the artist modified. John Hanhardt already introduced the piece um, briefly today. Basically, Pike removed the audio head from the device, extended it with a long cable, and invites the audience to drag the audio head across um, the, um, the audio tape that is glued to the wall. The audio tape has recorded content and depending on the direction of, and the speed in which you drag it along, you hear different content, forward, backward, high pitch, low pitch, and so forth. Um, through the artist's intervention, the audio content on the tape is no longer only machine readable in a linear way. Pike made the content accessible on the wall and handed it over to the human audience to randomly access the content by hand. The artistic concept of this piece is dependent on analog, magnetic, tape recording technology. 
This work could not be rec recreated with a different or contemporary technology. No dig digital disc or file-based audio technology provides a physical audio head that is removable from the machine and operable by a human hand to achieve an audible output. TV Crown is also dependent on analog technology, in this case, cathode ray tube technology that Pike modified to achieve the crown effect on the TV screen. The piece consists of a modified um, CRT uh, TV set, two generic audio generators here that create an audio signal. The audio signal is amplified by these two generic audio amps and relayed um, to the tube. Um, in which the electron beam or the raster writing electron beam is basically um, um, uh, controlled by the audio. Um, and so, the, sorry, <laughs> so the crown is um, generated. Um, Oh, and there's also another little de device, this custom-made little box here that has two functions. One is to shut off the TV uh, when it overheats, and the second is to generate an electronic hum that is also relayed onto the, um, onto the yoke at the tube neck um, to generate the moving, floating movement of the crown. So let's take a closer look at the, this artist modification. I'm going to show you a short excerpt of a video. Originally, in the 1960s, the piece was installed for interactive use. By turning the knobs of the audio generators, the audience could modify the pattern of the crown. Uh, the video is a little bit picking up here. One audio generator is used to modify the horizontal deflection. The second generator is used to modify the vertical deflection of the electron beam in the CRT. The generated audio signals are output to connect to the two audio amplifiers. The speaker outputs of both amps are directly connected to the yoke on the back of the CRT, with two red cables controlling the horizontal and two yellow cables controlling the vertical deflection. Taking a closer look at the modification of the TV set, we see that the original yoke of the Samsung TV has been removed from the tube neck and cable tied to the back of the case. The original yoke is still connected to the circuit board for maintaining the TV's basic scanning functions. The other yoke that is now attached to the tube neck was sourced from a different TV and has the sole function of receiving the incoming audio signals and modifying the horizontal and vertical deflection of the electron beam. Underneath the added yoke, there is a second copper coil that is custom made. The function of this coil is to subject the electron beam to an electronic hum. Without the hum, the crown would just be a static horizontal bar on the TV screen. Yeah, it, um, it would go on, but we don't have the time to look at it in detail. Um, this work could not be translated to flat screen technology. Of course, you could videotape the crown and then play it back on all different kinds of screens and different um, digital media. But the idea of imposing a musical or audio intervention onto the TV image, live and in real time, the idea of silencing the mass medium and forcing it to display a colorful self-generating pattern would be lost. TV Crown's core identity is conceptually dependent on cathode ray tube technology. In contrast to random access and TV crown, the equipment used for TV garden is not artist modified. The TV sets that are arranged in a jungle of office plants are generic, off the shelf, and they display Pike's video global groove. There is no conceptual dependency of the piece on cathode ray tube technology, because technically the video could be played back on digital flat screens or even be projected. However, TV Garden does have an aesthetical dependency on CRT technology. The sculptural qualities of CRTs and their 4 by 3 aspect ratio make this technology significant for TV Garden, and the artist reportedly pronounced preference for CRTs and did not promote their replacement with flat screens, although, as we learned today for some of his pieces, um, he did have 
the defect tubes replaced with LCD screens, but mostly kept the CRT casing and integrated the flat screens inside. While all three pieces display some kind of dependency on analog technologies, the artist did not dedicate specific devices to the pieces. According to his intent, the equipment is not unique, there are no original devices defined as part of the artwork. On the contrary, different equipment was used almost every time the pieces were realized before they became Guggenheim collection works. And if you take a closer look at the dates, we're talking about several decades of exhibition history, all the three of them. To give you an example, I'm showing you TV Crown in its 1982 iteration at the Whitney Museum. We saw um, a number of images of that show today. Um, and you see this nice piece of living room furniture here. And in its 2002 iteration at the Guggenheim Museum, you can see that for every iteration of TV Garden, more or less contemporary TVs were used. TV Garden always mirrored the time in which it was displayed until CRT production was terminated around 2010. And here at the Smithsonian, um, you can actually witness one of the first times that TV Garden is realized after the termination of the CRT um, production, um, which means that it's no longer, it no longer reflects contemporary technology because um, we would only have flat screens there. Um, the sets that you can see upstairs are approximately 10 to 15 years old and were sourced from the Pike archive here at the Smithsonian. So from now on, if we want to preserve the integrity of the piece and respect its aesthetical dependency on CRT technology, we will have to freeze the work in time. We have reached the limits of its variability. To be able to show this piece in the future, as well as other pieces in our collection that rely on CRT technology, the Guggenheim has started a major initiative to source and stockpile CRTs. And because sourcing and testing Used CRTs today is a full-time job and requires a well-maintained network of vendors. We've commissioned Mr. Louis's team at CDL Electronics in New York to do this work for us, and they are doing a tremendous job for us and other museums. The conservation challenges we are facing for TV Crown and Random Access are even more complicated because they involve artist modifications that add unique and original qualities to devices. If the condition of a modified device is beyond repair, simple replacement is not possible without losing the artist's handwriting. We know that Pike challenged the traditional concept of the original during his lifetime, and that he considered his modifications as conceptual, transferable, variable, versionable, and oftentimes had collaborators conduct the modifications for him. But we also know that he was still attached to being the author of his pieces. He frequently placed his signature on equipment and com components, and he famously said, quote unquote, everybody can make such a sculpture, but I sign it. When I am dead, it's your problem to find out which is the original, and he's talking to conservator Christian Scheidemann here. I have two originals, one piece, and a copy of a better quality. So what is guiding conservators decision making if one, the artist is no longer around, and two, has not left much guidance on how to evaluate and maintain equipment components in his works, and if technolo technological obsolescence puts a time cap on variability. In the case of random access, Guggenheim Conservation identified several criteria that added unique values to the equipment and led to the decision not to simply replace the deck when it was broken, but to preserve this equipment as an original and restore its functions. And if you uh, might wonder why we even consider to replace the equipment, I can refer to the variable media interview in the Guggenheim archives in which one of Pike's assistants specified that period equipment should be used when reinstalling random access in the future. So the first criterion for originality, and is this, um, um, and this is not a joke, <laughs> is this acrylic housing that Pike Studio fit, custom fit precisely 
to accommodate the 1970s RCA um, open reel deck and the 1990s amplifier. This is the support for the wand with the audio head when it's not in use. This rather improvised looking <laughs> acrylic housing carries nothing less than the artist's signature in fading Sharpie letters. And you can see here, I put a little piece of paper here so you can see it better. You can see Pike 63 slash 99. Any replacement equipment with different dimensions would be incompatible with the acrylic housing, which has to be considered as an original part of the artwork. Opala, moment. The second criterion for originality is this hole that is cracked into the plastic casing here on the bottom side of the, of the open reel deck. If you look through the hole, you can see a transformer that was cable tied and hot glued into the deck through the hole without even removing the casing. We wanted to find out um, if that added transformer, which you can see here, that's the guy, provided a specific function to random access. But when we removed the casing and compared the board to the photo schematics that you can see here on the right, oops, this is basically the photo schematic of this board here, and you see where the new transformer has been added. There used to be an old transformer in place. We noticed that um, the new transformer was simply added to replace probably a defect um, transformer before and that no additional function has been added. It was simply a quick repair by the artist or his collaborator to prepare the vintage audio deck for use in random access. Um, by the way, this, this picture was taken at Do Art Film and Video in New York where we worked with Maurice Schechter to restore the piece. So this repair might seem like a contingent detail to you with no discernible meaning for the work, but it does provide significant evidence of the handwriting that is so representative for the technical confidence and efficient improvisation practiced by Pike and his collaborators. In other words, if we would replace the device, and we would probably, um, our device would look a lot more thorough and clean and well done, and we would lose the traces of the mentality that created the work. A third criterion for originality is the fact that this particular Guggenheim deck is not the conceptually cleanest manifestation of random access. If we take a closer look at the, um, at the audio head here, and this is, this is the audio head here, the back of the audio head, the tape would be transported here in the front. We are surprised to find the audio head there. It should be missing. It should be removed from the deck and soldered to the cable extension as practice for all other existent random access versions. Our Guggenheim version is unique because the effort of removing the head was avoided. Instead, an available audio head from a completely different machine, in fact a video machine, was used <laughs> was used for the visitor interaction, and its cable extension was simply uh, soldered to the back of the head that remained in the deck. Last but not least, compared to other existing versions of random access, and we unfortunately don't have the time in the frame of um, this event to go into the details of versions, but it's very interesting. The Guggenheim version is the only version that combines, combines both the existence of original, artist provided equipment and the full interactive functionality while on display. And um, I should say that you will probably not get to interact with the piece today here in the exhibition, which, and this is a message to John Hanhart because he was blaming conservators today for um, preventing interactive use. Um, Guggenheim Conservation is completely okay with interactive use of the piece. It was the Smithsonian who decided um, to only allow interactive use of random access in the frame of guided tours. And I think this is mainly fact um, due to the fact that there are, uh, is an abundance of kids here who like to come and visit the Smithsonian and would probably um, get out of control a little bit.
So, but we, but we can assure you that the, the Guggenheim's random access is working just fine after we restored it to full function. When the Guggenheim's TV crown was asked for loan to the Smithsonian show here, we were immediately worried about our artist-provided modified CRT. We cleaned, examined, and tested the TV, but although our TV crown was still functioning more or less reliably, we, quick, we click, quickly came to the conclusion that the original piece would probably not survive the eight months long show in DC with a seven days, week, seven days per week uh, running time, or in the best case would suffer considerable wear. And you saw in the earlier video that TV Crown's modification is much more complex and elaborate than the one that we see in Random Access. The audio deck in Random Access can easily be repaired and maintained probably far into the future because the deck's functions are reduced to those of a preamp. If TV Crown's CRT breaks down and it does get terribly strained during display, through display, there's only so much you can do. Replacing the device when the life cycle of a CRT comes to an end will have to be accepted for this piece. Um, this was when we started to explore the possibility of creating a replica of our original TV crown, an exhibition copy for the Smithsonian show that would provide the full functionality of our piece and resemble our TV crown aesthetically in terms of the color type and date of the TV model, in terms of the look of the crown, and in terms of the cable colors and equipment setup. Luckily, hello. Oh. <laughs> Not a problem. Luckily, Mr. Louis and his team were confident to take on the job. And as a preservation measure for the future, Guggenheim Conservation set out to video document every step of the modification in detail, not only as a treatment report, but to capture Mr. Louis's embodied knowledge as a guidance for future stakeholders who decide to have TV Crown replicated again. And I'm going to show you um, just a couple of minutes from the 50 minute long technical video documentation that we made. I hope it doesn't pick up again. A few modification steps are still missing, such as the brightness control and the fan, but in its current state, the TV should already be able to display the basic crown pattern. Testing shows that the crown is successfully produced, but there are two details that need to be corrected to match this crown to the original. First, the replica crown displays a rotating gap, and second, this, is this crown here. is disturbed by picture noise. Both phenomena, the gap, which represents the vertical blanking in the collapsed video image, and the picture noise are created by the internal RF signal, or video signal, that is currently applied and that needs to be removed. To solve this problem, Mr. Louis studies the schematics of this particular TV make and model. Since every TV set requires individual solutions for several steps of the modification, having access to the schematics is essential to replicating TV crown. For this particular TV model, the solution for eliminating the RF signal was to modify the TV's main board and add three capacitors that short circuit the video signal. This measure resolved both problems at once, the gap in the crown and the picture noise. The manual brightness control on the TV crown replica is also achieved by adding a minor modification to the TV's main board. The green and yellow cables at the top left corner of the circuit board connect the manual control knob to a variable resistor that has been added to the board. By shifting the voltage with the control knob, the brightness of the TV can be regulated. The control knob gets attached to the exterior of the TV, accessible to the person installing TV crown. The placement of the brightness control knob is dependent on the design of the used TV model. While the Guggenheim's original TV crown had room to accommodate the control on the back of its housing, hidden from curious visitors, the design of the replica's TV model necessitated the placement on its side. Mm, I think this... 
Yeah. I would like to end my considerations here and would like to extend my gratitude to those whose invaluable expertise we rely on when preserving analog media art. I want to thank Mr. Louis and his team, Raphael Shirley, who's here today, and Maurice Schechter for generously sharing their expertise with us, for letting me film and photograph and pester them with millions of questions. I hope that you have plenty of questions for me and for us. Thank you.